So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Um, our first speaker will be Dr. Nicholas Giudici. Um, Dr. Giudici is an associate professor of spatial informatics in the School of Computing and Information Science at the University of Maine. He is the director of the Virtual Environments and Multimodal Interaction Laboratory and affiliated with the University of Maine National Center for Geographic Information and Analysis. Today, he is presenting a 20-minute talk titled, Touch and Haptic Interactions, Current Progress and Future Research. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nicholas Giudici. I'm used to people doing that. Thank you, Natalie, for organizing this. Bernie down. That's Bernie, my dog. He often gets excited doing these things down and uh, John and Smith Kettlewell for hosting. Uh, so one of my uh, New Year's resolutions this year was to not use slides during 2018 talks. Yeah, yeah. Trying it out. <laughs> See, this is the first time. Some people have been really upset, and I'm just like, deal with it. This is a haptics talk, no, <laughs> not, a, not a vision talk. Uh, so this talk kicks off a panel discussion on, as Natalie said, haptic perception. And my focus today is on uh, haptic perception and uh, uh, in its relation to technology and haptic technology. So there'll be some overlap with other things, but this is really how I think of the intersection of Val's work. She really was that rare breed that just made significant contributions to both, and that's often not the case. Uh, as a disclaimer, I am staying at a very high level today. There's no data, not really that much in specifics. We have, everyone on this panel has a lot of data, so if you really are interested in that, that's, that's good. But my goal was to kind of discuss some, some issues that, that, that I think of in the field, to throw out some uh, <coughs> positions that we can hopefully debate. If you don't agree with me, that's absolutely fine. That makes the debate more fun. So uh, my first position, I guess, is that of the three primary senses, vision, audition, touch, uh, haptics is by far the least studied and the most underappreciated. I'm a blind guy. I, I obviously really like and, and use touch a lot besides, you know, in my, my, my work, but also just in daily life. Uh, most people here study haptics, so you may not kind of agree with this, but for, as far as the general public is concerned, this is certainly underappreciated. And for researchers, I would say that it's often kind of very, there's a narrow focus of study that, that kind of miss, miss the breadth of what is possible from tactile perception. Uh, so what I mean is that we have a lot of really great research that's been done on sensory psychophysics of touch, on haptic perception, on haptic learning, and all you know, various related fields. Uh, but this work is often limited by, it's limited to kind of specific perceptual parameters. We look at things like uh, acuity thresholds and tactile resolution and the like, or we look at particular tasks, braille reading, contour following and, and various things. So we look at developing very specific types of technology. And, and the bottom line is that these are all really critical parts of the puzzle. They need to be studied. In fact, they really need more study. Uh, but that said, they also, this is kind of a problem in that the, 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 this work is often done in isolation and there's not enough crosstalk between people that are doing basic science and those that are kind of driving the tech development and I'm not going out on a limb here, but it's something that's been said for a long time and continues to happen. And I see this as really being detrimental to the field uh, because I think it would greatly benefit. And this is something that obviously Valve really understood and was doing uh, from more cross cross pollination of research findings that kind of you know, the basic research that really helps to advance the haptic tech. Um, so I guess what I'm arguing is that I'm trying to break down the tactile silos. I'm in academia. We have to say silos. Um, so there's a couple of, of uh, research biases that I think contribute to this segregation of, of touch-based research. Probably more than a couple, a, a, a couple that I'll throw out though. Uh, there's a bias in basic uh, uh, touch studies on kind of static tactile stimuli in, in very highly controlled lab settings. There's obviously a, a, you know, some good reason to do this, but I also argue that the, the, the research that we really need at this point is kind of what I think of as touch in the wild, right? So studying its use in uh, real world situations, looking at dynamic stimuli in, in uh, naturalistic environments. And this is needed because, uh, you know, in daily life, touch is, is obviously an active process. We use it actively. There's lots of other environmental contaminants. I'm talking about research contaminants. Um, 
uh, and there are uh, the, the the conditions that uh, generally we use haptic technology are in situations that aren't lab-based studies. So we really need to know how perception works in these situations. And the bottom line is that the, the perceptual parameters that we've determined in the lab are not necessarily valid in the wild. So my argument here is, is that there really is uh, importance for driving uh, more translational haptic research that, that really does a better job of, of connecting the underlying uh, you know, haptic perceptual factors that we would use actively in the real world that will ultimately really make for better and more intuitive technologies. Okay. Um, and I go on to say, yeah, combining basic, this is my soapbox, I'll, I'll, I'll get off that one. Um, so there's lots of ways to do this. Uh, in, in my lab, we're, we're kind of developed, uh, my student Hari is here, and we've developed this kind of thinking about bridging this gap using what we call psychophysically inspired usability studies. So these kind of allow us to characterize perceptual parameters using some kind of general psychophysical methods, but not in the normal sense, because we're, we're looking at them with real world scenarios or using actual technologies and, and kind of trying to combine usability with psychophysics. None of those things, or those two things don't usually go together. Uh, obviously there's, there's different ways to do this, but I think trying to combine these uh, different methodologies is really important for this field. Okay, second bias. Um, haptic research often focuses on studying salient stimuli or movement behaviors or uh, specific forces related to pressure-based touch perception. And obviously that's important, but there's also a lot of other channels to touch. I mean, it's an amazingly broad modality. This is the same sense that provides us a sensation of being burned and giving us an orgasm, right? It's an amazing sense. It has specific, it gives us thermal properties. We feel hot and cold. We feel vibrotactile and electrostatic stimuli. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of a, you know, I think of it as very, uh, one of the most diverse modalities. Yet people tend to study only one of these kind of components. Again, this is getting back to the silos. So, you know, we, we perceive the world and our nervous system works in an amazing way to kind of combine all of these different aspects of, of touch. We integrate all of these stimuli but we generally don't study them all. And so I'm arguing here that touch-based interfaces would, uh, and technologies would be greatly benefited by combining more of our knowledge and what we study from basic science and combining these into more of our designs and trying to implement more of these aspects into our, our technology instead of just looking at say cutaneous stimulation or force feedback or vibrotactile or what have you. Okay, so. Uh, I fundamentally believe that, uh, can you guys hear me? I feel like I'm coming in and out. No, you're good. Okay. Uh, I fundamentally believe that if we do a good job in understanding and characterizing tactile perception, that touch-based displays can uh, effectively, can be effective in most cases as visual displays in supporting lots of different tasks. So let me just briefly discuss the underlying theory for this claim. Um, this brings me to my second position. So I'm going to argue here that haptic and visual information share the common denominator of space or spatial information. So if you think about the 3D structure of the uh, world around you, the relation between edges and surfaces, the direction and distance between objects and people, you know, these are all spatial properties that can all be specified really well through vision, but they also can be specified through other spatial channels, vision, audition, spatial language. And, and I've argued, and as do others, that, that touch is really the most similar to vision in, in a lot of ways. And it is one of the most perceptual of our senses. If you feel you see the edge of this uh, lectern here, the stimulus properties are the same and the brain may take these in from different inputs, but it essentially is, and I'm generalizing obviously, but it cares most about the commonality of the stimulus properties. So, you know, vision has a, uh, is a great conduit of space, but I always say it doesn't have a monopoly on space. Um, so the point here is that there's this growing body of research looking at uh, this notion of common spatial computations between the senses. And the results from now a growing number of converging paradigms are suggesting that there's far more similarity than difference 
in multi-sensory multi -sensory spatial information processing and uh, representation in the brain. So uh, this is an area that I've worked in now for, for a while, I guess longer than I, longer than I think. Anyway, it's an area that I've, I've, I've looked at a lot. It's, um, it's, it's what we've called functional equivalents uh, of spatial information. It's been done work with Bobby Klatsky and Jack Loomis. And the, assess the essence of the argument is that spatial information from different inputs so again, vision and touch or, or what have you, build up into a common amodal spatial representation of memory. And we call this the spatial image. And what's important here is that as long as the input modalities are matched in terms of their information content, the ensuing spatial image functions or, or can function equivalently, equivalently to support different types of spatial behaviors. Okay, and there's several ways to kind of get at, to test this hypothesis. Uh, I won't go into it that much here, except to say that you know, the general procedure is that you compare learning on the same task between two or more modalities. So imagine you're learning a, a root map, maybe you're seeing it or you're feeling it. And then you're using a common testing paradigm for both modes. So, so you're going to assess a spatial behavior, like pointing between locations or doing a JRD task. Um, so you might uh, do this with eyes closed, and you, so it's a common task, and you have people do this after both mod uh, learning with both modalities. And uh, so we found you know, functional equivalence across a lot of different types of studies. And so the most important application of, of this kind of basic uh, functional equivalence results are that the findings suggest that we can expect similar outcomes when using non-visual interfaces to perform tasks or to access information that we traditionally would do with a visual display. Okay, so that all sounds very good, but there are some significant challenges that screw this up if you don't consider them. And they really need to be thought about when we're developing uh, these types of technologies. And, 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 and the biggest one, I think at least, is to identify the right information to be displayed and, and to figure out the best way that it should be presented. Um, and and this, this is particularly important for uh, sensory sub substitution devices. So when we're taking in information from one modality, say vision, and, and spitting it out through another, say, through touch. Um, so you can't just simply convert a visual map into a tactile map and expect that the resulting spatial product is going to be meaningful or make sense. And, you know, I review papers all the time that people seem to try, still try to do this, but it turns out it, it rarely works. So the problem is that vision uh, has conservatively 500 times greater sensory bandwidth than touch. And so to be effective, if you're doing visual to tactile conversion, it requires this kind of principal downsampling of visual to tactile information. And so what, you know, what I see here as a really important fact is that good sensory substitution, and a lot of what we're talking about with haptic displays is, is, are, is doing sensory substitution. Uh, this requires more than a fancy conversion algorithm. It, it, it's a work, if we want this to work and to be useful, we need to understand the sensory mechanism, both of the input and output channels, we need to carefully consider the uh, sensory translation rules and the cross-modal mappings. And we need to know what information uh, is perceptually salient to the output channel. So if you're converting color to touch, that can work, but it's not necessarily a natural mapping. If you're, doing, if you're substituting spatial information, this generally works well because this is a natural mapping and, 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 and space is salient to both sides of the equation. Um, for me, the key problem that still we, we need to really think about is that if we want to advance the next generation of touch-based technologies, we, we need far more research on ways of optimizing kind of smart information downsampling. What are the intervening filters that kind of serve as the, the layer between the input and output modes? And this kind of intelligent processing essentially is is uh, where I see the next big leap in uh, haptic technology design is headed. I think that we're starting to, uh, to, to see that. And it really, the, the, what's important here is that it's forcing the connection that I'm harping on here of understanding the human perception, tying it to tech development. Okay. Um, let's briefly discuss some haptic technology as it relates to uh, perception and some challenges that are out there. Uh, so the most common method of presenting 
taxable stimuli is through uh, uh, hard copy tangible media. So probably everyone here has seen embossed maps uh, besides Braille, but looking at uh, uh, graphical information, graphs, diagrams, what have you. And there's lots of production techniques doing this, including uh, tactile embossers and swell paper and affixing tactile pieces to boards. I can't tell you how many times in grad school I, would, I used all matter of things to try to represent nerve tracks and neural nets and what have you. Uh, increasingly, we're using 3D printers to make models and that you know, that can work well. In fact, all of these approaches really have, uh, they all can work and some of them have been used for years. Part of the reason for their success is that there is a lot of uh, basic research that's been done and guidelines that have been developed that kind of specify how these things and how these outputs can be used and, and, and based on perceptually valid stimuli. Uh, each certainly has its pros and cons. That's not my point here. They all share some common shortcomings though. Uh, generally, these are expensive to produce, except for the pieces of uh, you know, sticking pins and boards. Uh, generally, they're slow and, and difficult to author, the tactile stimuli. Um, and they're generally based on st static kind of unimodal output. And so these are all factors that you know, we need to consider if we're going to develop new touch-based technologies. Um, and if we want them to be adopted and actually reach the end user, that's one of the things that I find most frustrating here. A lot of things are developed. They may stay in the lab and the workbench. They rarely get out to the people that could most use them. So the good news, I think, is that we, uh, th th there's lots of new dynamic haptic technologies that are being made. And these are including you know, force feedback, pin arrays, vibrotactile, electrotactile. These are things that uh, there's lots of others. Sheila will talk about these later. We have some excellent panelists here that uh, are going to talk about some of the technology that they're developing. So I won't go into that a lot, except to say that there's some really excellent things on the uh, solutions on the horizon. Okay, position three. The use of haptic information is one of the most underutilized interface styles in technology design. So uh, again, I'm not going out on a limb. Some of you may disagree, but if you look at most interactions, touch is used as a very secondary or tertiary uh, aspect, not generally primary. And this is both surprising and unfortunate given all the potential kind of applications that touch-based uh, you know, touch technologies could afford. Um, again, as I said, the, 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 the trend I think is, is, is reversing here, but there's also some longstanding problems and pitfalls that I think have limited the advance of haptic technology. Uh, in my opinion, the biggest problem is probably uh, we, we tend to over constrain the users and the applications of this type of technology. So, uh, you know, we, we develop haptic tech generally for uh, very specific users, for very specific applications. So maybe we're using it for medical applications and robotics, for alerts and redundant queuing and devices. Uh, for non-visual accessibility. And, and uh, you know, much of the area that I work, is, work in is in the accessibility domain. So looking at uh, use of this type of technology for blind and low vision people, I mean, it's what I know best. But I've realized that even in this kind of limited domain in, in my research as well as others, it's, it's very constrained. We often ignore many of the potential users that, that could use this te technology. So, for, for BVI usage, the emphasis is on totally blind people. Totally blind people represent, you know, maybe 5% of legally blind folks. And so there's this huge swath of, swath of legally blind people that could benefit from the same haptic information or even combined haptic and visual information that are generally not being served in a lot of this uh, design and a lot of the research. There's also many other uh, applications to sighted people that I think could be used a lot more. So if you think about eyes-free uh, interactions, such as when you're driving, emergency management scenarios or situations where people are operating in the dark. Uh, there's lots of others, but this, this kind of expanded usage um, you know, really, I think, allows, you know, speaks to the, the efficacy of using haptic displays in, 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 as a primary interface in far more use scenarios. And, and to do this, though, we need to start thinking about how 
the development, how, how understanding perceptual variables and perceptual factors can support these types of tasks, which have not generally been studied. OK, last quick position. As I've kind of hinted, the trend in uh, this trend is starting to turn. I think that we're really entering a new age of haptic awareness, new types of haptic interfaces, haptic interface design. Uh, I just attended the, the uh, IEEE Haptics Conference and heard about and touched a whole bunch of really cool and exciting stuff. Um, I'm always trying to find cool displays that people show me and I want to play with them and often try to steal them. Um, I rarely succeed. But anyway, there's, uh, there's, a, lot of, there's, there's a, a lot of stuff on the horizon right now and a lot of stuff in the development path uh, pipeline that I think is people are starting to appreciate the need for using perception in, in human studies and you know, actual usability instead of getting stuck in this engineering trap and just designing something because someone has a cool idea and you know, maybe met a blind person once and thinks that they might use this. Uh, and then you're you know, not really solving a real problem. Um, I'm really excited that the, the, the biggest class of technology, per, personally because we're studying it, but, I, but what I'm really excited about are touchscreen based smart devices uh, they're devices that have a whole bunch of universal design stuff built in. You can do vibrotactile and auditory output to convey information. It's all there. It's free. It's part of the interface. We're currently working on uh, developing, yeah, great, developing a, uh, a device that allows us to access graphics and kind of boldly thinking of it as a very early stage graphic screen reader. Um, that's another talk, but, I, but I'm excited about where we're headed is the bottom line. So. Uh, that's my overview, and there's way more that we could dig into a lot of this, but I think now we're going to uh, move on to our panel discussion. And the goal here is to dig a little bit more into perhaps some of the themes that I brought up, some of the some questions that I'll uh, put out, and then some just kind of general discussion by the group and, 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 and you, the audience, can jump in as to where the field's at, what we need in, in, in these types of, uh, these types of aspects. So we, we have a great panel, Gordon. Uh, Laura, Morty, and Satani, I think you're all going to uh, hopefully come up and join me here, and maybe you can start by just introducing yourself. So, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Nick, for a great talk. Um, so now we'll have a 25 to 30 minute panel discussion. Um, that will address current challenges and future directions of haptic perception. Um, as Nick mentioned, uh, the panelists include Dr. Gordon Legg, Dr. Santani Tang, Dr. Morton Heller, and Dr. Laura Lakova. If the panelists open up discussion to the audience, uh, we ask, like we said before, that you please state your name before you say something. Um, and Daisy also will be coming around with a microphone to give to you to talk. Um, and then I'll also hand this microphone over to the panelists. So when you speak one at a time, you can just hand the microphone to whoever's speaking and just make sure it's on. Um, and then maybe we can begin the panel by just, if you can each please just say your name and then maybe a couple of sentences about um, who you are and what your research is on currently. Okay, so please join me in welcoming the panelists. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Santani Teng. I'm a, a fellow here at Smith Kettlewell, um, and I am here uh, sort of on both a, a basic research um, interest, which is what I'll talk about today, um, as well as an interest in um, applications to uh, assistive technology. The basic research has to do with the neuroscience of uh, sensory loss, so how the brain reorganizes in response to blindness. Um, and this is sort of what uh, uh, the perspective that I'll be taking um, in the discussions and uh, if I show you some data later. Yep. Um, my name is Gordon Legg. I'm from the University of Minnesota. I'm mostly a vision researcher, so I'm a little bit of an imposter here. Um, but I do use tactile displays and I'm interested in them. And uh, at Minnesota, we have a new center called Center for Applied and Translational Sensory Science. Translational issues related to vision, hearing, touch, etc. I'm Morton Heller. Uh, I've been doing research on haptics in a number of different areas. I've studied Braille, I've studied spatial memory, I've studied haptic pictures and perspective. Uh, 
and I've been publishing articles in the field for more than 40 years. It's, it's been a while. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know. Yeah, I'll, I'll go on a rant after everybody introduces themselves, because I take a, a slightly different, I have a slightly different view of a lot of the things that uh, Nick talked about. I agree with him on a lot of things, but I think that too many people are biased against touch, quite frankly, and see, and see things visually. Okay, my name is uh, Laura Likova. Um, I'm uh, director of a lab of uh, brain plasticity and neurorehabilitation here at Smith Catwell. Um, so I'm mainly, I or started as a vision scientist, but uh, over the last 10 years, um, I, my interest was focused on uh, neuroplasticity and looking for methods to non-invasively drive neuroplasticity to um, enhance uh, perceptual and cognitive functions in particular in uh, the blind um, with focus on the haptic um, modality. Thank you. So Nick, who starts? I guess I'll, I'll start throwing out some questions. I don't think I'm following the order. Are the questions listed there? And oh, yeah. Anyway, I don't, uh, the questions that are listed aren't quite the questions I have. So we don't have to <laughs> all, <laughs> but in general, what are some of the biggest challenges that you folks as the panel see in the field at, at this moment? And, 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 and what are the most um, critical changes that you think we need to make in, in kind of in order to advance uh, moving forward? Oh, I think one thing we need. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. We need to know what normal touch is. I mean, I test subjects. And I, I, yeah, thank you. Uh, I test subjects, and there's some, you know, the variation is huge among sighted yeah. subjects, among blind subjects. I think, you know, we know if somebody has poor vision, we, you know, put up a Snellen short. We need a Snellen short for touch. Right. We need something that would be really easy to use quickly. So, you know, if we get an outlier, we know there's a reason for that. Um, that's one thing we really need. I mean, I think that we don't have normal samples whenever we do research, whether it's with, with Sighted subjects and blind subjects, we don't really know what's going on. And you're talking beyond two point thresholds. Oh, and yeah, I don't like think that, that yeah, that's yeah. not, I mean, I don't buy the threshold yeah. me measurement. Uh, thresholds are, are kind of meaningless for a lot of the things that we do. Right. I mean, I think, for example, that touch is the primary and best spatial sense uh, for lots of reasons. I mean, it sounds kind of radical here among haptics researchers, but. I mean, I, I shaved this morning. I thought I did a good job looking in the mirror. Then I felt my face, and it wasn't quite as good as I thought it was. Uh, Carl Sherrick pointed this out to me one time, a long time ago. I mean, I can feel textures I can't see. I mean, touch will do some things really well. Um, you, you can make judgments about very fine textures that you can't judge visually. I mean, auto mechanics do that when they feel a paint job. You know, people making furniture do that when they feel a surface to see if it's smooth enough. There are things that you just can't see that you can feel, like a nick and fishing line, for example. Uh, the line can break and you can't see it, but you could feel it readily. You know, so the idea that, you know, touch has better spatial resolution, I mean, that vision has better spatial resolution, that was my unconscious thinking popping out there. In some ways, I mean, touch is, is better. In some ways, it's not. It's different in a lot of ways. And then people just tend to generalize. Um, and so it's those generalization, generalizations that hold us back in a lot of areas. People really need to have an open mind in, in doing research. There's, I mean, there, I, I don't know, I, I could talk about some other biases that are here that, uh, that really need to be looked at. But I think that's one area. We need, we need a good way of telling if we have abnormal subjects. Hmm. You know, we, we can tell if people need to wear glasses in an experiment, but we don't know if, if we should reject them because their tactile performance is poor. And we really need to know that. So, and also uh, how it changes with age. Oh, yeah, no, no, it, it it's definitely changes yeah, with age. Yeah, that's something we don't characterize well. So you, yeah, I can. This is Gordon, like, can you hear me? I don't know. I don't know yeah, okay, so as kind of a basic sensory scientist, I like to dissect haptics into some components. There's uh, touch or sensory acuity. I'm actually going to talk about that a little bit in my lightning presentation. Morty says we need a chart. I'll pass around a chart that you can use for measuring tactile acuity. Um, but haptics is more than obviously sensory touch. It's motor control and proprioception. And there's also a very strong cognitive component. And Nick mentioned age. Age could affect any of those components. 
so you know, kind of as a reductionist, I'd like to see us, uh, you know, you know dissect, dissect haptics into its components, see how those components interact in various tasks, and see how they change with factors such as age or, or other variables. Nick, I'll pass it back to you. I could take oh, yeah. yeah. Can I throw one more thing in there? When sure. You, when you read the literature, nobody agrees on what it means to be blind or early blind or congenitally blind or, or late blind vision. or low vision or any yeah. of that. And it's really confusing trying to make sense out of the literature when there's no agreement on any of that. Tony, do you want to? Yeah, um, that was a great point. I was actually just going to jump on that. Um, compared to uh, the other panelists, I'm <coughs> brand new in the field, but um, I have seen a lot of uh, these things that um, uh, both uh, Morton and uh, Gordon said. There are huge variations, um, both in the uh, blind subjects that I, you know, that I've seen, and um, in the brain responses to the same haptic stimuli, and not very complex haptic stimuli, just sort of Braille letters, which mm -hmm. is kind of a, a mm. baseline. And so, um, the, getting back to the question of like how we might want to move the field forward. Um, and I feel like one of Natalie's questions was, you know, or one of your questions, uh, uh, Nicholas, was, you know, what might happen in the next five or 10 years? Um, in the area of uh, neuroscience, there's a lot, of, there's a, sort of an explosion in really fancy computational techniques that I'm just kind of riding their coattails um, to, to really sort of interrogate the information content um, and not just sort of when, you know, where or when the brain does something. We're finally getting to scratch at what the something is. And so, for, you know, from the basic neuroscience perspective, what the brain does with this information um, is we're starting to crack that open. Yeah, I, um, I have to say it's really a rich and very interesting field. Um, Nick said something that uh, um, a big uh, leap in the future will be to look um, in between the input and the output. And I relate this to something Gordon said also, that we have to, to dissect like the whole uh, process. Um, so we talk here about haptics and so also um, Nick uh, uh, um, uh, was uh, relating, I mean connecting haptic, haptic, haptic to um, the uh, design of new haptic uh, technologies. So one thing I see over, because one of the questions was, was like over the last years and then what we see in the future, um, I see that we are kind of going out of the engineering trap by uh, looking at the more user-centered uh, designs, which means to understand the process of haptic uh, perception. Uh, my impression is that, uh, I mean, there is a lot of progress, but like the focus is still at the lower level of sensation. And even when we talk about perception, um, still, I think um, there is a lot, a long way to, uh, to go. Uh, so uh, cognition, so we have uh, from uh, all the receptors in the skin, in the joints, uh, um, we um, go to perception, but then it's very, uh, in haptics, it's maybe even more important to look at the cognitive aspects and how we can uh, compensate and how we can enhance this. Because in one of the big advantages of vision is that we have parallel processing. And this is one of the reasons plus high resolution to make vision the, the dominant sense. And I agree with the point Nick said, it's uh, central, central in my studies also, that um, space transcends any uh, specific sensory modality. We are trying to reach out through different senses and to get um, a representation of uh, space. But the, no, it, the, I would say the disadvantage of uh, the other senses and haptics in particular is uh, we have this sequential processing, which means that we have much um, higher demands on spatial temporal integration, which inevitably involves memory and um, creating um, understanding and creating memory representation. We may have all the resolution in the world and 
uh, discriminating between points and so on, but we have to learn to understand and to be able to create um, um, really precise and stable mental maps, we also call them. So th this is the focus of a training method I have developed and is showing that we can really in a proper way rapidly achieve this and uh, this is could help people across different tasks. Um, so I think this is one big direction to focus how we can, like when studying perception or sensation in haptics, people usually focus on limitations and restrictions. I think that when we look at least at the cognitive level, we can think for methods to drive brain plasticity and go beyond what is considered recently um, possible. And uh, I'd like to add one more point in relation to coming to the technical and uh, tactile or haptics um, aesthetics, uh, which is part of um, um, people really liking and using the devices. So going to the I'm not in the, on the technological side, so this is very, you know, more not from first-hand experience, um, but side view. Um, uh, my impression is that many of the development in assistive haptic technologies don't go beyond the developmental stage. So it's important to think for about scalability and um, Nick was um, uh, emphasizing uh, like broad applicability. So from blindness and different level of low vision, combined vision, touch, um, going to um, also the sighted like iFreen technologies, so which will help for the dissemination of um, the haptic um, based technologies. Okay, thank you. Thanks, this is Morton Hiller again. I, 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 people assume that vision is the dominant sense. Uh, here's a thought experiment for you. Try to imagine sitting here, doing anything at all if you couldn't feel your bodies. You couldn't interpret what you're seeing. You wouldn't be able to sit up. You'd, you'd fall on the floor. That's happened to people. There are rare cases of people who've lost bodily sensation. They can't function. They can't walk. They, they have to use vision to then guide motion. Uh, it, it touches, a, in some ways, a really important, significant, dominant modality. The other issue that I don't agree fully with is the idea that touch processes serially and vision processes in parallel. That depends on skill and scale. Um, sometimes vision has to process serially, like if you have a large object and you're really close to it and you can't see all of it at once. Touch sometimes processes in parallel. You get whole word effects in reading Braille, for example. So it's a kind of generalization, but it depends on skill levels whether you know about materials you're using. It depends upon the scale that you have, how large things are. Touch works on a smaller scale. You know, you can't feel uh, Japantown from here. Can't see it too well with the hills either, uh, but it depends on scale. So it's a kind of generalization. If, you know, if we really know something well, we can process in parallel in vision, but that was an issue in vision. We can't always process in parallel in vision. You know, try to imagine writing down an address in an Eastern European you know, tongue that's been written out in English, you have to do it letter by letter. At least I've had, you know, if the language is different, you've got to process letter by letter in a serial fashion. So it depends on prior experience. I uh, agree. Only a brief comment. I, um, I agree with your comments. And you're bringing uh, the skill, which means learning. Oh, yeah. And where we come again to some of the issues I was trying to bring. Well, you know, we, for we, we forget about all the learning that's gone on visually that hasn't happened haptically. Yeah. I mean, that. I'll try to weigh in on this as well, Gordon Legg. Um, first of all, I want to, to go back to one of Nick's comments about tactile or haptic displays. Seems to me that the uh, advent of smartphones, <laughs> gestural in, inputs, they're a tremendous example of a successful haptics um, interface. I'd like to hear about other successful haptics interfaces. That's just one question I have. But going to this question of bandwidth, Nick said, Vision has like what was it five hundred times the bandwidth, something like that. Normally, yeah. What, whatever. I mean, I think that's right. I think that's a real problem. We shouldn't deny that. Vision has very good acuity, and most ways of comparing tactile acuity to visual acuity 
tactile is lower. Also, vision is very adept. Eye movements, you know, can scan a, a space very quickly. Maybe not entirely parallel, but I, I think I agree with Laura that you can cover a lot of spatial information very quickly with eye movements. You can do the same with hand movements examining a tactile map. It just takes longer. So um, I think there really is a bandwidth problem, and that'll challenge the use of tactic, ta tactile interfaces. Can I say one, yeah. one last bit? Yeah. It's still based. Yeah, but no, not all. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, no. <laughs> um, I, one at a time. <laughs> okay, before this thing cuts out on me, um, I just wanted to say, you know, I really love these examples that call into question uh, sort of the the assumption that, well, touch is what you use when, you know, you don't have vision, which is obviously the better sense. So, like, this sort of hierarchy we think of, um, when was the last time that you had a coffee cup in front of you and you saw what was behind it, right? And I don't mean objects that was occluding, I mean what was on the back surface. With, um, you know, with just a hand, you can look at the back of something that's in front of you. So you get this amazing 3D um, scanner in a hand uh, that you don't get with your eyes. And this is one of my, this is one of the things that just uh, learning about like this. Without your hands, though. Yeah, you are not. <laughs> so, so it's sort of a, you know, a visual haptic interaction, I guess. Um, and I kind of want to reiterate a point and really echo that like ha using a smartphone has made me um, in a very invested way, be a huge proponent of universally accessible design, um, especially after I dropped it and the keyboard stopped working. I was like, oh, great, you know, I can use the voice commands and so on. Um, I, I feel like there's, you know, from that trivial example, just making things accessible in as many modalities as possible um, is not just a, you know, an assistive technology. It is just a universal technology, I think. And be good to keep that in mind. Yeah, and I think this will come up again in the in the technology component. And I think that's a, a really important point. That touch is not, and kind of what I was trying to get at the end of the talk. Touch is not just meant for some you know niche aspect. I think we're all kind of agreeing. There's this visual centric way of thinking about the world, and, and haptics can provide a huge amount of information that sometimes, if we get away from our visual lens, helps us to think about. You know, and, and, and things like technology, smartphones, you know, voiceover, for example, was made for, you know, initially for blind people. And it turns out it's great for <laughs> lots of other types of people with learning disabilities. English is a second language. Um, unfortunately, uh, I, I don't know if there's any Apple people here. And if there are, I apologize. But Apple's certainly led the, the field on uh, accessibility with speech. Uh, they've kind of kind of missed the boat on haptics in terms of they don't let you have access through your API to and controlling it, and, and Android devices are really far better for that, and that's really unfortunate, and they seem utterly unwilling to figure it out. So, um, yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty unhappy with Apple on, and with that. Anyway, let's go to another question. We, have, we don't need to get to all of them, but given some of the limitations, and Laura and others have hit this a little bit, but just given some of the limitations that we've talked about with touch, some of the potential biases, how do we, uh, how, how do you folks think that we best advance kind of the combination of haptic perception and haptic technology moving forward? What are, what are techniques that we need to think about? Cheaper displays. <laughs> yeah. And maybe thinking not restrictively in terms of haptic technologies, but uh, multisensory, yeah. the brain is multisensory. Yeah, 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 I know yeah. you're doing a lot of great work yeah. on multisensory research. So, uh, yeah, we should think augmenting it, augmenting it with other uh, sources of information. We're, we're always using vision and touch. I mean, we use touch to get a kind of frame for where our body is in space and the vertical and the horizontal. And we use, we use touch to localize things and we use vision to localize things. Um, and m most people who are blind aren't totally without light perception. There are lots of ways of using visual information to help people localize objects in space if they have low vision. Yes, we tend to ignore that. All right. Building on that, where, where, <laughs> where, do you, where do you see the next five years? What's the most exciting thing people here think of? And I'd like to dump this out to the audience as well. Let's start with the, the panel. Josh? Okay. 
so we have a question from yeah. from Josh. Yeah. He's not the panel, but that's fine. Okay. So you, <laughs> you want to run through the our hands Yeah, why don't we go through the panel first as I said. I I just wanted to say in the next 5 years I think um, just the uh, methods for analyzing, you know, the, the, the brain response to haptic stimuli. Um, that, you know, computers have made really sophisticated analyses much more accessible and possible um, to people who know how to use them. And this is something that we are seeing right now, and it will just uh, sort of accelerate in the next, um, you know, in the next five years. I think we're close to a, a computational model of braille reading, which you know is something that. Overall, we haven't seen a lot of at, you know at, at the neural level, for example. Yeah. I'm not sure I have any um, great predictions. I think actually the uh, tactile interfaces can help visually impaired people uh, help solve some kinds of visual tasks like uh, orienting or pointing or localizing or aligning cameras. I think I think there've actually been some successes where tactile feedback helps in. Um, taking photos, for example, or, or mm -hmm. aligning on a page of text. So I think com combining tactile, tactile information to help solve visual problems could be, could be pretty, pretty helpful. This isn't a, a clear <coughs> looking forward kind of answer, but I think we need more of a focus on trying to find out what people can do rather than what they can't do. And I think it really mm -hmm. handicaps all mm -hmm. of us if we tend to focus on limitations yeah. rather than possibilities. Good point. So um, again, uh, I'd say that um, <laughs> yes, we have to uh, understand what people can do and cannot do, but also to focus on way what people uh, can do beyond what is thought that, that they can do, like with um, um, effective learning strategies and better understanding brain plasticity and how to drive brain plasticity to um, achieve this kind of, uh, of changes um, and uh, um, yeah and again we should not be restricted in uh, thinking about the future uh, haptic design uh, restricted to one modality the brain is trying to use all the modalities and in a complementary uh, way um, I think um, yeah so that that's for now <laughs> N Natalie how are we doing on time And forty, <laughs> and forty seconds. Sorry. Uh, why don't we throw? Huh? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I just want to throw out to the audience, and I know Josh has a question. So, where are we going in the future? And just adding to that, I, I, I've made the argument that I think there's a lot more potential applications, and how do we get touch to kind of be used by more users, more applications? So, either of those, the, the people have input. Josh, I know so, you have. Uh, um, hi, it's Josh of Smith Kettlewell. Um, I just want to. Um, I think the most exciting thing to me that's happening right now um, on the on the um, science side is just that people are starting to actually um, effectively understand or starting to um, apply some some real rigor and new new methods to understanding um, tactile and and proprioceptive perception. And it's just that's exciting because the um, and for obvious reasons and then the on the technical side we're starting to see um more ways of presenting tactile and haptic information which um can only i think those two things taken together are pretty exciting i also wanted to just take this opportunity to quickly say that your um nick your approach you, you know you're mentioning of um uh, vision hearing and and uh touch as with touch being the most poorly understood i i uh, um, I think that's fascinating, and I think I want to frame it in this way. I want to say um, we've been studying how to fool vision for a really long time, <laughs> and we're really good at it, and vision is easily fooled. And um, we also are pretty good at um, creating uh, auditory um, fakery, and we're really bad at creating tactile and haptic you fakery. There are tactile illusions. There absolutely are, but they are um, they're rare, and um, and they're when you when you show somebody to them, when you show somebody a tactile illusion, it is almost more mind it um, almost always more mind blowing than showing them a visual That's illusion, because, because we're not we're not used to being having our sense of touch fooled, not at all. 
one brief comment only. I think that the, um, there, um, there have to be more uh, formal way, systematic way to enhance the uh, conversation between the people who develop uh, the advanced technologies mm. and people who do the haptic uh, research. This has to be, uh, well, I mean, very, very active uh, and it's good to be in systematic, well-developed dialogue. The groups like this. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. like now. And I hope this is only a beginning here and this symposium may become a tradition. Excellent. Do we have one last question? Yeah. Hi, Nick, it's Sheila uh, hey. from the University of Michigan. I think one thing that's missing from this discussion is the whole concept of meaning making and how um, whatever technology or methods we put in people's hands, they will seek to find meaning in the environment around them through whatever means or by whatever means we give them. And um, that, I think, is something that Val was very interested in understanding um, through all the work she did with Ting and, and other people. So just to say that, uh, you know, beyond understanding the cognitive and neural basis of touch, there's a whole cognitive slash perceptual basis of meaning making that's, uh, I think, very relevant. Well, thank you. Uh everyone for participating and I think now we'd we move on to the